I was talking with my wife Sarah this week about the historic significance of this coronavirus pandemic that we're all experiencing right now. And she pointed out to me that this is shaping up to be one of those landmark moments in all of our lives, the kind of moment that we reflect on and analyze for years to come. I mean, we're going to remember and retell stories about where we were and who we spent this time with and how we coped and what we missed the most during quarantine. Because the fact is that the, the quarantine experience has been different for everyone. We've each faced our own challenges and losses along the way, and obviously it's still going on. Now, I realize that among our audience, there are some of you who have lost family members to COVID-19. And I want you to know, we realize this ordeal has been toughest on you, and there's no way that any of the rest of us can understand exactly what you're going through, what you're facing. And I want you to know that my earnest prayer for you has been that you would experience profound and unfathomable comfort in your spirit that amazes you during these dark days. But it's still true for each of us that all of us have suffered through this crisis to one degree or another. And if I was talking with you face to face, you would probably say something like, well, you know, there are a lot of people who have had it much worse than I have. And that's probably true. And that's a mature, healthy perspective to have about all of this. But let's be honest. Let's be honest with one another for a second. Come on, just between you and me. Have you spent any time thinking about the people whose quarantine has been a lot easier than yours? Now, you don't have to admit it out loud. I know you don't want to sound ungrateful and you don't want to sound silly, but just in your own mind, have you daydreamed even a little about a quarantine getaway with less worry and less responsibility? Because I know some parents who have young children in their house and these parents haven't gone 45 minutes in the last two months without changing a diaper and everything they've watched on TV has been animated and they're a little envious of all of the adults out there who have their homes to themselves and they take naps and they watch movies and they work on projects. And I know some people who live alone who would say that this time has been excruciating and depressing for them and they're a little envious of the people who have family or roommates or young children in their home to at least share this experience with. And I know some people who have lost jobs, and that's a real challenging reality. And they might be a little envious of people who still have a job to keep them busy and a paycheck to pay the bills. And the list could go on and on, but wherever you are and whoever you're with and whatever your circumstances have been during this pandemic, you can probably think of someone who's had it easier. Someone whose quarantine experience sounds like a piece of cake compared to your quarantine experience. But just in case nobody comes to mind, let me introduce you to Olivia and Raul. This is a newlywed couple from South Africa, and they were on a honeymoon at a five-star resort in the Maldives when coronavirus forced countries in that region to start closing their borders. Now, if you're not familiar with the island nation of the Maldives, Imagine the most peaceful, tropical ocean view that you can think of, and then imagine private cottages built on stilts out over the water on top of the coral reef. This is the Maldives, and it's easily one of the most dreamed-about vacation spots in the world. And this is where Olivia and Raul got stuck when the quarantine hit. There were no flights in or out of the country, and they were the only guests remaining at the resort, and so they had the run of the entire place to themselves, along with the attention of the resort's entire staff who was mandated to stay on site as long as there were guests there. So for three weeks, until the South African embassy worked out an evacuation, this couple's demanding schedule was sleep in, snorkel, lounge by the pool, eat in the resort restaurant, and repeat which sounds like my kind of quarantine. And I thought about them this week while I was out mowing the lawn, and I had, I had a little hint of jealousy. And I wonder if you can relate. You know, we've been in a series of messages for the past couple of weeks called Trapped, and it's all about idolatry, which is a concept that comes up over and over again in the writings of the Bible. Now, you probably don't think about idolatry too much in your day-to-day -day routine, 
Outside of televised singing competitions, we don't talk about idols much in our culture. So when you think of idolatry, I wouldn't blame you a bit. If your mind recalls scenes from Indiana Jones movies or pictures from world history books. But the truth is that idolatry is both prevalent and prolific in every culture around the world and has been throughout recorded history. Now, it takes different forms, and in some instances, it's more easily recognizable than in others. But simply put, idolatry is what happens when we misdirect our loyalty. It's when we allow a feeling or a status or a person or an experience to become our ultimate motivation, and it begins to master us. In primitive cultures, like some of the ones we read about in the Bible, idolatry frequently involved worshiping statues that represented deities thought to control the forces of nature and fate. In more modern cultures, since we're much more civilized than that, of course, our idols are usually more subtle But in both cases, primitive and modern, the goals are the same. Primitive cultures chased achievement and prosperity and security, much like we do. And while achievement and prosperity and security are not bad things, it's possible for them to become too important to us. It's possible for these good things to become God things to us. One writer in the 16th century put it this way. He said, The evil in our desire typically does not lie in what we want, but that we want it too much. And that's the trap of idolatry. Because when we make a God out of a feeling or a status or a person or an experience, we then begin orchestrating our life and manipulating our circumstances and framing our decisions to get what we want. And it's all about our desires. And at its core, idolatry always includes and involves a little jealousy. We become envious of a life that's just a little better, a little easier, a little more enjoyable than the one we have. We resent our circumstances. We crave something different. And then in our quest, we can easily place something good on the throne of our heart that was made for God. But there's only room on that throne for one. Now, lately we've been diving into the story of the Israelites recorded in the Old Testament portion of the Bible. These were the people God chose to display God's love to the world. And the plan was for the Israelites to enter a covenant agreement with God. They would trust God and worship God exclusively. And in return, God would show the rest of the world through protection and provision for Israel that all the other gods were powerless, meaningless. And the passage we're looking at today, it comes from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 4, and it's a record of what Israel's leader at that time, Moses, wanted the people he was leading to remember as he was nearing the end of his life. He was reminding the people of Israel about everything that God had done for them and everything God had commanded Just like their parents before them, this generation of Israelites had been witnesses to God's mighty works and God's generosity. And Moses says in Deuteronomy 4.15, Be very careful. You did not see the Lord's form on the day he spoke to you from the heart of the fire at Mount Sinai. Now the point he's making is that when God spoke to the people, when God appeared... It wasn't in a form that they could describe. God is much too majestic, too transcendent to be represented by a statue or to be comprehended by the human imagination. And as Moses recounts God's commands to the people, it starts, it begins with this command about idolatry. Moses says in verse 16, So do not corrupt yourselves by making an idol in any form whether of a man or a woman, an animal on the ground, a bird in the sky, a small animal that scurries along the ground, or a fish in the deepest sea. And when you look up into the sky and see the sun, moon, and stars, all the forces of heaven, don't be seduced into worshiping them. The Lord your God gave them to all the peoples of the earth. Now, I know that sounds a little bit random to our modern ears, and you're probably not tempted to sculpt a fish or a bug or a woman or a star and start worshiping that sculpture. But that's the sort of religious 
naturalism that the Israelites witnessed and even engaged in when they were in Egypt. It was common for cultures in that time to worship the sun or worship something else from creation to try to manipulate forces they couldn't otherwise control. But pay attention to that last sentence. The Lord your God has granted these things to all the nations who live under heaven, all the peoples of the earth. That means that the God of the Israelites is the God who also provided for the other nations of the world, whether they realized it or not. It means that Israel's enemies are also the recipients of blessings from Israel's God. But God was using Israel to show the world the wisdom and the benefit of an exclusive devotion to Israel's God. Which is why Moses says what he says next in verse 20. Moses says, remember that the Lord rescued you from the furnace, the iron smelting furnace of Egypt, in order to make you his very own people and his special possession, which is what you are today. See, God had a plan to turn Israel into a beacon that reflected God's goodness, but God won't share the spotlight. And so Moses continues in verse 23 and says, so be careful not to break the covenant the Lord your God has made with you. Do not make idols of any shape or form, for the Lord your God has forbidden this. And then Moses says something that made the Israelites catch, Israelites catch their breath, and it ought to take our breath away. Moses said, The Lord your God is a devouring fire. He is a jealous God. Now we all know what jealousy feels like, right? And frankly, we've been conditioned to think that jealousy is not a noble virtue. It certainly doesn't feel admirable when I get envious of those people who were stuck at the resort in the Maldives during the quarantine. But what does it say that Moses is referring to the Lord as a jealous God? Well, for one thing, we've got to remember that if God really is the creator of the universe and everything in it, then God's character is the barometer for which virtues are noble and admirable. But it's important you know this too, that in the original language of the Old Testament, the word for jealous and the word for zealous are the same. In fact, if you have a Bible of your own, your translation may say that God is a passionate God. What this means is that God's love is enthusiastic, that God's love for us is passionate. And that means that God's not interested in only having a portion of our hearts in return. And if that's true, if God really does love us that much, then the jealousy of God may be the most striking, compelling, and monumental feature in all of create Christianity. You see, this is the part of the Christian narrative that separates it from all other religious systems. I mean, think about this. The Egyptian god of the sun didn't punish the Egyptians for also worshiping cats and rivers and statues. And perhaps that should have been a clue to the Egyptians that their sun god wasn't as capable or engaged as they thought. But this jealousy of the god of the Christian story, this is the feature of the story that makes it almost un unimaginable that someone would make this up. Because consistently, throughout the entire biblical narrative, Consistent in the Israelite history and in the prophets and in the New Testament, the creator of all things, who owes humanity nothing, sacrificed everything and would give anything to pursue us. No other religious system would make this claim. Nobody else would suggest that a God would stoop to the level of chasing after rebellious humans. But the God of the Israelites, the God of Moses and Joshua, that, that God chases after humanity, passionate for our attention, longing for our hearts, zealous for our devotion. And not only that, this God goes first. Because before this God asks for our attention, God gives undivided attention to us. And before God requires our hearts, God gives wholeheartedly to us. And before God requests our devotion, God is devoted 
to us. This God is a jealous, zealous, passionate, enthusiastic God, and this God will not share your heart with anyone or, any, or anything else. And that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Because isn't it true that when it comes to the things that you love the most, you want them all to yourself, right? A couple of weeks ago, my wife made a chocolate cake, and it's a cake that everybody in the family loves, and so it doesn't last very long at our house. And at one point, there was one piece of cake left, and then the next day, that piece of cake was gone, and it's a bit of a mystery, and I still don't know who ate that last piece, but I know that for the past couple of weeks, there have been some accusations thrown around about fairness and sharing, because nobody in the house got as much as of that cake as they wanted. And that's just a cake. Think how much more possessive we are about birthday gifts or date nights, weekends and spouses. And I'm here to tell you what we can only begin to comprehend. That our jealous God is possessive about you and doesn't want to share. God will not split custody of your heart with anyone or anything else. There's only room for one on the throne of your heart. And the trouble is that too often we claim to worship God, but we accept a lifestyle that depends upon most everything else. And whatever we depend on is what we'll ultimately serve. And so today's message, it's a reality check and an opportunity for you to take inventory. To ask yourself questions like, who or what is sitting on the throne of your heart today? What's competing with God for your devotion? What are the areas of your life where you're tempted to complain the most? What keeps you up at night? What entices you to overspend? What are you worried about? What makes you mad? What do you daydream about? What makes you feel the safest? Because the answers to those questions and questions like those can reveal a whole lot about what's become most important to you. And you may not like some of the answers, but the good news is that the God who has been pursuing the Israelites for all these centuries since the time of Moses is still pursuing you. He's chasing you, jealous for you, passionate for you. Now, what are you going to do about that? Thanks for joining us today. I hope you have a fantastic week, and may the Lord bless you.